This morning we're going to start a, um, a, a mini-series, a three-week a three week series um, on something that I've just kind of had on the burner. Um, I, I started maybe a, a number of years back and I've and, um, been looking forward to kind of taking a Sunday and going through a subject that oftentimes gets um, perhaps ignored um, and the, 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 um, the subject we're talking about is the blood of Jesus Christ, and specifically this morning, we're going to look at the significance of the blood of Jesus. And then um, from, from after this, um, Lord willing, the plan is to jump back into my favorite style of preaching, which is more expository, going through books of the Bible, and we will be jumping into, Lord willing, the book of Revelation. And so I've been working on that series. I know many of you have been um, asking, when is that happening? And uh, I figured, you know, before the rapture takes place, let's... <laughs> Let's see, it might be getting a lot closer than we think. I'd love to be preaching through the revelation and the trumpet sounds. That'd be a good thing, right? And so, uh, but I'm, I am so looking forward to uh, doing that. But um, at the same token, I've really been looking forward to, to talking about this, this subject that oftentimes kind of gets taken for granted, um, kind of goes under the radar. Um, I was thinking this morning, you remember like when your kids were little and, um, especially maybe in the earlier days where you didn't have as much uh, resources. And, and so their birthday came or Christmas came and you did everything you possibly could to, to buy them as much as you, you, know, as you possibly could. And, and you kind of gave it to them. They're like, oh, this is great. And they, they never realized fully, obviously at that young age, um, the currency that was involved, right? The, the price, the, the cost it was for you to give them that gift, right? And I think sometimes in the church, it's, it's much the same way we, we recognize and are thankful for the forgiveness forgiveness that we have. We're thankful for um, the access to God that we have, but sometimes we, we fail to take a moment of pause and recognize that the means by which that takes place is the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, we hear many references um, to the blood of Christ all, all throughout the pages of the scripture. Certainly, we, we spend much time uh, singing about the blood of Jesus. And, and whether it be, um, whether we, we speak, uh, sing specifically about the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow, or sometimes there's words that we'll use that are directly connected to the blood of Jesus. We used, the, this morning we sang about our Redeemer, right? The one who buys us back. And sometimes we fail to forget the way in which he buys us back is through the equity of his blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that causes him to buy us back. We sang about the fact that we have been ransomed by him. We were purchased by him. We were taken out of captivity and made free again. Why? By the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and so we want to take a pause this morning and these next couple of weeks to kind of take a look at the significance of the blood of Jesus this Sunday. Next week, we'll take a look at the, the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus. And then the following week, uh, we'll look at the supremacy of the blood of Jesus. Because I think that if we can really understand the, the impact of what that means to us, then we'll really appreciate the significance, the sufficiency, and the supremacy of Christ's blood. And so this morning, as we, as we consider the topic of the significance of the blood, we, we, it's interesting, we read through the scripture um, oftentimes, and logic would tell us that when there's a theme that we see that often comes to the surface in the scripture, um, the more that it's brought to the forefront, um, the more uh, uh, significant it would be. Certainly everything in the scripture is of significance, but but. But there are times and there are themes that we will see woven all throughout from Genesis to Revelation, all woven throughout the scripture. And as we see that highlighted as often as it is, it kind of screams to get our attention. It highlights the value and the significance of something that God is wanting us to wrap our arms around to gain a greater appreciation for. And this, this theme of the blood of Jesus Christ is, is woven all throughout the text of Scripture. 
We're going to go through a bunch of, of scripture verses. I'd encourage you uh, maybe just to write them down. It'd be a lot easier than, than, than kind of um, jumping over there to them. But um, John chapter 6, uh, Jesus is speaking. Verse 53, he says, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, if I didn't tell you that was in the Bible, you'd be thinking like, what's like some horror movie? Like, is that, a, is that a line out of some, is that some script out of a horror show? But these are the words of Jesus. He is speaking to the followers that were with him, to the religious leaders that were listening in. Right, and he says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. What incredible words that are flowing from the lips of Jesus here. What Jesus is ultimately saying is that we are to identify with the blood of Jesus Christ and the body of Jesus Christ so intimately that as, as if we are taking it in. If you don't have my blood, you have no life in you. Luke writes in the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 28 he says pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock he's giving instruction on on how shepherds are to see and and care for the flock of God he says pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, look, which he obtained with his own blood. The purchase of the church of Jesus Christ was made possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. He obtained, he purchased the church of Jesus Christ by his blood. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by our good works. No. By our church attendance. No. By our, our reading of the scripture. Certainly not. Therefore, as we, as we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of Almighty God. The blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, justifies us, declares us innocent before the God of the universe. We had committed cosmic treason against, against the judge of the universe. We were deemed guilty. And the shed blood of Jesus Christ is the means by which our disposition before God changes from guilty to innocent to being justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, saved from the wrath of God. Ephesians chapter two and verse 13, by now in Christ you who once were far off, how many have been far off at one time in your life? <laughs> Yeah, some of us have been way off, right? Right? And so what Paul writes here is, but by now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. By the blood of Jesus Christ. Not because somebody invited you, not because you believed the right stuff, not because of anything you did. We were invited to draw near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter one and verse 19 and 20. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, speaking of our Christ and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, look, making peace, how? By the blood of the cross. The most diabolical, vicious, aggressive, bombastic event in history resulted in peace between man and God. Why? Because the blood of Christ 
was shed for you and for me. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. I love that. How was the, how was the covenant made sure and put in motion? By the blood of Jesus Christ. By the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you in every good work that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The, 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 the new covenant was put in action by the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter five and verse nine, we see there's a song around the throne that is going to be sang that is directly connected to that event that took place some 2000 years ago. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God for every tribe and language and people and nation. The reason we'll gather around the throne one day, the reason we're identified as the redeemed, the reason that we can have this hope that we sang about this morning is because he has ransomed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is replete all throughout the scriptures. Our last verse, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and they have conquered him. Who? Satan and his power and his influence and his grip on us. They have conquered him. Why? How? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. This is just a mere smattering of, of a few passages that are woven all throughout the scriptures that make reference to directly and indirectly to the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to cover more as we, as we go through this series together, but I want to highlight for you this morning the significance of this subject and by showing it that it is a theme that is taught all throughout the New Testament. This theme of the, new, of the blood of Jesus is, is taught all throughout the New Testament. And, and here's the deal. To fully appreciate the significance of the blood in the New Testament, we need to view its value and its significance as revealed to us in the Old Testament. If we really want to get the full aha moment out of what the New Testament is giving to us, we must look at it through the lens of the Old Testament because sometimes what that does is it kind of brings it from black and white to color, right? You remember the old black and white TV? You don't have to raise your hand, right? But, but it, something happens, right? Remember the first time you saw Wizard of Oz in color? Like, hey, I didn't know that red hair, right? It's just kind of like the lights go on. And a lot of times that's what happens when we kind of consider New Testament truth in light of the, what the scripture teaches us in the Old Testament. It just really opens up our understanding and certainly greatens our appreciation for it. And so let me just say a couple of things here. That from a very practical sense, without blood, a body cannot live. You don't need to go to medical school to come to that understanding, right? You, just a, a very simple understanding would communicate that without blood, there is no life. Life is in the blood. Nobody would debate that. Perhaps this truth, though, helps us, helps us to understand those often misunderstood words that Jesus makes in John chapter 6, where he says, unless you drink my blood, you have no life in you. What's true in our physical body is certainly true spiritually as well. Unless we have the blood of Jesus applied to our life, there is no life in us. He that drinks my blood has life, Jesus says. And so clearly in the natural, blood is essential for life. However, we will see, so it is true in the spiritual life as well. And to gain a better appreciation of the, of the significance of blood, we need to go back to the beginning, not to the beginning of the New Testament, but all the way back to the beginning of the Old Testament. 
all the way back to the beginning. And so here's the scene in Genesis, right at the beginning. If you don't know where that is, go to the table of contents, turn right, right? It's boom, right there, right? And, and we see right, right in the beginning of time before time was created, God was there, right? We see that God is eternal and God creates right in the beginning of Genesis chapter one. And he begins to speak the world into existence. All that is comes into existence through the spoken word of almighty God. He doesn't need anything to create. He creates ex nihilo out of nothing. God begins to create and speak into existence planets and stars and land and water and people and creeps and creepy things and all these things that are all over the earth. God creates all these things and then he creates man and woman. The, the crescendo of his creation, he places them in a garden to enjoy all that God has created, to enjoy fellowship with their creator, and they have but one restriction. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Why? What? Everyone was, everyone was wondering, why, why didn't God want them to eat of that tree? It's very easy if you think about it. They've already experienced everything that was good. They had seen everything that God created. If you look at the text, everything God created, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. Everything God created is good. So here's Adam and Eve. All they have at this point is a knowledge of what is good. And what God is saying is, don't eat of the tree. Not that I'm looking to keep good from you. I'm looking to keep evil from you. But they thought that was something that they wanted as Satan comes and he, he comes and he tempts them. You know, the story has God really said you shouldn't eat of the tree. He's afraid that you're going to become like him. And so they eat of the tree. And the Bible says sin enters into the world. At that moment, everything that was perfect shifts. And they eat of the tree. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 says, and the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths to cover their nakedness. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. That's when you know you're in sin, by the way. That's when you know you've stepped over the line. When, when you come to that place, when you know that you've done the wrong thing, our first reaction is not to run to God, but to run from God. This is, this is not the first time God showed up in the garden. Every other time God showed up in the garden, they would come, they would fellowship, they'd have communion, they'd enjoy their creator, but not this time. And they said they hid themselves to the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. It's where fear begins to come into the garden. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said the same thing men says all the time. <laughs> the woman, I didn't choose her, you gave her to me. <laughs> if it's not her fault, it's your fault. Because you gave her to me. You knew what she was capable of. I could just preach on that alone. That's another, <laughs> it's another whole day. <laughs> The woman who you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And at that moment, everything that was perfect is shattered. And God in those next verses begins to unveil the consequences because sin must have a consequence. If God does not punish sin, he needs to cease to be God because he is just. And we see the consequences of sin 
on men and women and on the earth and, and upon Satan himself. But we see something very interesting in verse 21 of chapter three. And it says, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Up until that point, they were clothed with the fig leaves that they had created to cover their own nakedness, to cover their own sin. It's the perfect example of what people do today. It is really religion in its truest sense. It is man's attempt at trying to cover their own nakedness. The first thing they became realized after they sinned is that they were naked and they attempt to cover their own sin. And look what God does. The first thing God does after the consequences are laid out is God says to them, that is not sufficient. And he removes the fig leaves and he makes garments of skins, the only way that you can get skins is you need to skin an animal. It is bloody, it is gruesome, it is a mess, but he takes the skins of animals and he clothes them. It is the first sacrifice. It is the first time blood is shed in God's previously perfect garden. It is God providing for Adam and Eve what they could never provide for themselves. They attempted to cover their own sin and it was deemed clearly insufficient. You see, something had to die to pay the price for sin. There is a cost. And so God sacrificed an animal for the first time in his perfect garden. For the first time in Eden, death is on display. The shedding and the spilling of the blood of the animal was necessary so that life could be transferred to Adam and to Eve so they could live. It is a picture, a foreshadow of something that was going to come. It is a great teaching on the fact that man will never be able to cover their own nakedness. We need God to provide a sacrifice, a means by which our sin can be covered. The writer of Hebrews writes in verse of chapter nine and verse 22, indeed under the law, almost everything is purified. How? With blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so all the way back in the garden, we see the first sacrifice, the first spilling of blood to cover the nakedness, the sin of man. It doesn't end there. It goes right to their very own children. Cain and Abel, the first children the first siblings of humanity. Chapter four in verse one says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore us Cain. Do I need to connect dots for you? That just happened, right? He knew his wife and boom, they conceived and bore Cain. You can explain that to your kids later. Um, and she said saying, I've got a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel was also brought of the first brought, firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And so Cain brings the fruit of the ground, but Abel brings a sacrifice in blood of the livestock of the land. And the Lord had regard or favor for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. And so Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. What God is saying here to him is, you know, if you want to, if you want to please me, do what you know I expect. Your sacrifice was not acceptable to me because there was no blood. 
Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, when they were in the field, and Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Wouldn't you love to just smack him upside the head like, you, are you, who do you think you are, right? Am I my brother's keeper? The, the, the answer to that question is yes, by the way. We ought to be looking out for one another. But um, Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said in the same way, he said, Adam, where are you? What have you done? Have you eaten of the tree? Now we see his kids. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Cain brings a bloodless sacrifice, the fruit of the ground that it is not accepted by God. Abel brings a bloody sacrifice, the firstborn of the flock, and it is accepted by God. Cain's offering is rejected. Abel's is, is, is accepted. Why? Because of the presence of blood. You don't present an offering to God without the presence of blood. This is substantiated by Cain's defiant response to God. And God's response back to Abram, back to Cain. It's almost as if Cain was saying, You want blood? I'll give you blood and kills his son, his brother. And notice what God says: What have you done? The blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. Blood. This demeanor of Cain continues throughout mankind and in man and, and, and in man and, and it begins to escalate more and more as its rebellion towards God and embracing of sin becomes more and more manifest to the point where evil is in the hearts of all men save Noah. And God decides to judge mankind by sending a flood. You know the story. And so God calls upon Noah to build an ark, something that, that he was ridiculed and mocked for and spent a lot of time building that ark. And, and finally, the rains begin to come and the floods start coming in. And as the, the floods and the rains and the wrath of God becomes to come, begins to pour on the earth, they are rising above the wrath of God in the ark and they are in that ark for 40 days and 40 nights as they are continued to be, to be led by God. And then day comes where then God calls upon them to come out of the ark. And notice the first thing that Noah does. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. A reminder that while all things may be new around you, there is still a curse over the land. Sin is still present, and the blood will continue to be shed as an atonement, but even more so as a type of another sacrifice that would come and ultimately pay the price and the penalty for sin. We see it woven all throughout the Old Testament. Here's another. Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham takes Isaac, the promised son of God, son to him, and he walks up the mountain out of obedience to God to do the unthinkable and sacrifice his son. And just as Abraham begins the downward plunge upon his son, God stops him and says, Abraham, don't harm the boy, for now I know you love him. Love me even more than you love your own son. But what, did God do? what does God do? He provides a ram caught in the thicket and a sacrifice 
is made again at that monumental moment on Moriah. Blood is shed, a foreshadow of one who is going to come and pay the price for our sin. God taught Abraham, the first Jew, the importance of sacrifice. And this continues for hundreds of years all throughout the generations of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Fast forward to the, the time of Moses who, who God gave the Passover. Do you remember this, that story? Here's the people of God. They're in bondage. They are the slaves of Egypt. They're being taken advantage of by the Pharaoh and they're being kept from worshiping the one true God. And what was the cry of Moses to the Pharaoh? Let my people go that they may worship God. And Pharaoh kept saying no. And God we see in Exodus chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and into 12, God begins to send plagues upon, upon Egypt so that they would change and let Israel go free to worship. But it's very interesting, as we get into 11, we see the, the, the most severe of plagues that is unleashed upon Egypt and it is the, the death of the firstborn of every home and every livestock. God had said that he was going to come and put to death the firstborn of every home and every field. However, however as God always does, he provides a way to escape his wrath. In chapter 12, God instructs Moses, tell the people of God to sacrifice a lamb unto the Lord. I'm going to visit the land with death, but I have provided a way of escape for the people of God. The only way of escape is I want you to go and I want you to get a lamb and I want you to sacrifice it and I want you to spill its blood and I want you to smear the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the home. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12 says, God says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment for I am the Lord and the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God presents a remedy for the people of God. It is not a call to obedience. It is not a call to do anything other than apply the blood. He's like the death angel is coming and there's only one way out. There's only one means. There's only one way that you can escape the wrath of God. You take the blood and you put it on the doorpost of, the, of your home and when the death angel comes, when he sees the blood, he will pass over your home. That's where we get the Passover from. He will pass over your home, not because God likes you, not because you're cute, not because you've done anything, but because he sees the blood. It is the blood that gets the attention of God. It is the blood that catches the attention of the death angel and causes him to pass over and miss out on the wrath of God. This is a very profound and, and significant moment. You see the difference between those who were judged and those who weren't was not based on their nationality. It was based on blood. Who had blood on the doorpost of their home? Which brings us back to the original point that was made. Blood is, is synonymous with life. When the death angel would pass and he'd see the blood, life would remain in that home. But when there was no blood, death would come. So death is synonymous with the absence of blood. He that has the son has life, John will write. 
but he who does not have the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. And if we want to get out from the wrath of God, we must apply the blood to the doorpost, not of our home, but of our hearts. When God gave Moses the instruction on the Passover in chapter 12 and verse five, we see that it couldn't just be any lamb that was offered. It wasn't just some arbitrary animal that they were to slaughter and put their blood on the, on the post of the home. It had to be very specific. It had to be a very intentional one. It must be a male lamb. It needed to be in the prime of its life, not something that was kind of like on life support on its way out, right? It needed to be on the prime of its life. It needed to be spotless. It needed to be pure and clean. It needed to be innocent and and a virgin lamb that's never been touched in any way. The blood of that lamb, when applied to the doorpost, would save people from the wrath of a righteous God. There was no other way. There was no plan B. There was no other means by which people could hold on to to sidestep the death angel. Only the application of the blood on the doorpost of of their home. Only the spotless blood of an innocent party, of an innocent lamb. Do you see the connection? Here is John the Baptist. He sees him coming from afar. John chapter one and verse 29. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, whose blood will be applied to the doorposts of our hearts so that we might escape the death angel and the wrath of God that is coming upon all man. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. He is it. And he The lamb, Jesus of Nazareth, is the only one that possessed the same qualities of the lamb that was demanded for the Passover. He was a male. He was in the prime of his life. He was spotless. He was sinless. He was pure. He was innocent. He substituted his life, the innocent, for the guilty as he went upon the cross. He was the only one capable of paying the price for you and for me. And what was the price? The shedding of his blood upon our lives. Paul will write to the church at Ephesus in chapter one and verse seven in him, he says we have redemption through the blood of Jesus. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can wash away our sins. Only the blood of Jesus, not works, not religiosity, not baptism, or anything we can do. It is only by applying the blood, not to the doorpost of our home, but to the doorpost of our hearts. Peter writes in his first epistle, chapter one, and verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. He's saying, you weren't bought bought with, with things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's what purchased you. That's what redeemed you. That's what ransomed you. That's what brought you back into the beloved. The blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The significance of the blood of Jesus Christ ought to impact the way in which we see God and our relationship with God, realizing that it is only by the means of the blood of Jesus Christ. It ought to create in us a greater love and a greater passion and a greater appreciation for all that he has done 
understanding the significance of the blood does a couple of things for us. I'll lay them out to you. Number one, we're no longer striving for God's acceptance, but now we're moving out from God's acceptance. Because we are brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are not trying to get the acceptance of God. Because of the blood of Jesus, we already have the acceptance of God, and we can move out in confidence knowing that we have the acceptance of God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That changes everything, doesn't it? Because then it changes the reason that we do everything we do. We don't do to gain God's acceptance. Now we do because we've received God's acceptance and it is unconditional because of the shed blood of Jesus. Because of the significance of the blood, we're no longer under God's wrath but adopted as the family of God. That's what we were. We who were not a people, Peter will write, are now the people of God. We have been bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. We were at one time sinners under the wrath of God. But because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, applied to the doorposts of our hearts, We are no longer children of wrath, but we are children of the most high God, accepted. What makes us family is blood. What's true in our homes is true in the spirit. We are the family of God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that has been applied to our lives. The significance of the blood is important because our sins, past and present, are forgiven and washed away by blood. We don't need to walk in guilt and shame and bringing up stuff from the past anymore. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is what frees us from the bondage of guilt and shame and everything that comes as a result of sin in our life. When we confess our sins, the scripture says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us with what? With blood for all unrighteousness. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is the means, the equity by which we receive forgiveness. We are purchased by God by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our life is no longer our own nor was it Satan's. We are no longer children of wrath, but we are bought and purchased and we are the possession of Almighty God. How did he buy us? Was it money? No. Was it gold? No. Silver? No. What was the means by which he purchased us? It was the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the, power, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we conquer the power of Satan as well. I love that. No longer are we held captive. No longer are we in bondage. No longer are we addicted and and held captive by anything. But as the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life, the bondage of sin and is broken from our life. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. And when Christ applied the blood, that hold that Satan had on us is broken free and we no longer are held captive. Paul writes about that in verse in chapter six of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And he goes on to say, we who have been trusted, who have put their trust in Christ, the, the power of sin has been broken in our life. 
We don't need to yield to the power or influence of a substance or a behavior or some kind of an addiction that we say, I just, I just can't break free of this. Yes, you can. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ is more powerful than any addiction that might grip your hearts. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is significant for our everyday life. What does it mean to be a Christian? It's not just believing the right stuff. James says Satan believes all the right stuff. To be a Christian means having the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our life so that when God sees us, he sees the blood of his son. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, with this I'll close. Paul writes and says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And before we get uppity and start pointing a finger at them, Paul says, and such were some of you. This is what you came out of. This is what your identity was. This is what you're involved in. But such were some of you. But you were washed with what? With the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not your story anymore. That's not your identity anymore. That doesn't have a grip on you anymore. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. The significance of the, of the blood of Jesus Christ, it, it, it touches every area of our life, every area of our mind, every area of our spirit, every area of our behavior. And it ought to influence the way we think and the way we love God and the way we love one another who also have been washed by his blood and the way we go after those who don't yet have the blood applied to the doorpost of their hearts that are still under the wrath of Almighty God, may it drive us to love him supremely, to go after him solely, but along the way, pick up as many people as we can and bring them to the Savior. Oh, the significance of the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we, we recognize how unworthy we are in and of ourselves. And then we recognize how worthy we really are now that the blood of Jesus has been applied to our lives. I pray, God, that the truths of your word would transform the way we think, would help us to see ourselves the way you see us, that you're not taking metrics on our daily disciplines and choosing whether you will continue to love us based on that, but you love us because the blood has been applied to our lives. And because of that, we are the redeemed the family of God. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has not applied the blood to the doorpost of their hearts. Maybe you're here this morning, you've just not done that. You, you're still kind of trying to figure out this whole thing called Christianity. What do I do? How do I apply the blood of Jesus to my life? I'd say this to you, number one, recognize that his death on the cross, his shed blood was poured out for you. And recognize the sacrifice of Jesus is your only hope. It is the only means. It is not this church. 
It is not this preacher. It is not anything you do. It is the sacrifice of Jesus poured out for you that is the only means for forgiveness. And I would, I would call upon you this morning to ask Jesus this morning, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood and I will be whiter than snow. For those who have done that, may that impact the way in which we live our lives. No longer going back to what we were. For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May we march towards Jesus with all of our hearts and pick up as many people as we can along the way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. The significance of the blood. It's powerful, isn't it? Doesn't it make, just make you love God more? Yeah. He's just incredible. He's just incredible.